It's six minutes past seven, GMT. Welcome to Weekend from the BBC World Service with me, Julian Warwick. A little later in the programme, our Moscow correspondent, Steve Rosenberg, will talk about the perils of reporting during the Russian winter. It's 7.30 GMT, this is Weekend from the BBC World Service. Still to come, tens of thousands of people are leaving Turkey. We'll be speaking to someone who has sold her home and closed her business. And Democrats in Congress are talking about a Green New Deal to tax... You're listening to the BBC World Service. I'm Julia Morica with the weekend. With me throughout the programme, Elif Shafak, award-winning British-Turkish novelist, the most widely read female writer in Turkey, and William Jordan, the former US diplomat and specialist on the Arab world. And it is Turkey that we're going to concentrate on for the next uh, part of the programme. It's a country that's been going through tough times since the attempted coup against President Erdogan in 2016. More than 100,000 government workers including judges, policemen, soldiers and teachers have been dismissed and 50,000 people have been imprisoned pending trial. The economy too has suffered. Inflation rose to 25% last year. It is though now falling. Meanwhile, a lot of people have decided that they have had enough and are leaving the country. Ibrahim Sakechi teaches at Regent's College here in London and alongside him is Merve Bayandir, uh, who has left Turkey. Welcome to both of you. Um, Ibrahim, these figures, first of all, what sort of numbers are we talking about as regards those who have decided that they are leaving Turkey? We are looking at numbers very similar to countries characterized by wars like Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on. So the Turkey has always been a country of insecurity in many respects. And this is not the first time Turks are leaving Turkey in large numbers. In last two years and a half since the coup attempt in Turkey, or maybe we can call it an actual coup, because the end result or outcome is very similar to the last successful coup in Turkey in 1980. The total number of Turkish citizens applied for asylum in European Union countries, plus for uh, EEA countries, Norway, Switzerland, uh, Liechtenstein and Iceland, totals 45,000 plus. That makes Turkey one of the top five countries generating asylum seekers in the world. And how much has that figure spiked in the last two or three years? That is just last two and a half years. Right. And before that, the figure was significantly lower? It think? was significantly lower. I mean, overall, since the 1980 military coup, Turkey generated 1.1 million asylum seekers, asylum seeking applications. I'm emphasizing that because applications may involve dependents and the total number of people involved could be much higher. But the between 2004 and 2016, the numbers were significantly down. Again, we are talking about Turkey. It is it is an OECD country, yeah. an industrialized country, and it is the only industrialized country with total number of asylum seeking applications of its citizens per annum is beyond 6,000. But that is the change. Since 2016, the number went over first over 13,000, then over 15, and last year it was over 20. Merve, what's your story? Well, uh, I was a millinery designer back in Turkey. I was the first millinery in Turkey, which is surprising. Um, not first millinery, but millinery designer. Um, and I had a pretty good job. I, I studied in Canada, uh, humanities and psychology, and I went back to Turkey in 2004, funny enough, and uh, had my adaptation problems with my culture, own culture, uh, but eventually settled down find my way, start doing my business, and came pretty successful considering where I was doing what I was doing. And actually people started wearing hats. Then um, the social construction within Istanbul, I can't say it in general Turkey because I live in Istanbul, and sure. Istanbul is a very different city than the rest of Turkey, and it would be unfair to compare it with the rest. Um, the culture started to shift so much. It, it became to a point I, I decided to 
come here uh, before the coup attempt, so it was uh, almost three years ago, it got to a point that it, I was unable to walk in the street feeling safe. I was being harassed by uh, men all the time, and not just by men, even through women. And ha harassed the, why, specifically? Um, sexual harassment. Right. The reason why is because I was female. I had cars drive on my car in the highway because I was going faster than them. So it gets to a point you start to feel unsafe and you start to become more aggressive, which was happening to me. I was actually becoming a very aggressive person towards everyone, which was not okay with me. So you had a successful hat design yes. business in Istanbul and you have effectively sold that? No, I actually closed it down in Turkey right. and moved it to UK and it's still a very successful So business. it's still there, but you, can, you can't be there to look after it? No. I'm doing it here now. Right, I so I, I do sell from here to Turkey. That's what I do. But unfortunately, I am no longer a brand from Turkey. I am a brand from UK. <laughs> uh, people listening might say uh, they, they accept your experience. Obviously, you've told the story of what's happened to you and nobody's yeah. going to question that. But they might say, why not stay and stick it out and try and change it from within? See, I get that question a lot, especially after my past interview. Um, the, the thing is, you can fight so much. And uh, if you can't talk, how are you going to fight? I'm not going to fight with my fist. And it got to a point after Occupy, uh, Gezi actually, uh, it got to a point that I got threatened saying that my name was on the list to be arrested next. So my parents actually begged me to stop talking. Because I was on Twitter, I was actively on Gizzy, so it wasn't feeling safe. And then my brand became popular. I was more out there. So every word I said was out there. Right, Gezi being the reference to the demonstrations exactly. that took place in Gezi Park. I wanted to bring Elif in. Just, just, just to back up, I mean, to, to, yeah. to, because I, so it so resonates with me, everything you said. When you are a woman, I think the level of harassment also on social media, it becomes, everything becomes uglier. You know, if you're outspoken, of course, <clears throat> every journalist, every writer, you know, everyone who deals with words, I think, in Turkey knows that because of anything you say, you can get into trouble yeah. so easily. But when you happen to be a woman, the level of harassment and slander and hate speech is much, much deeper. So I can I can understand what you went through. Uh, William, come in with some thoughts as well to address to either guest. Well, no, I, well, I, I, I mean, this, what, what we're just talking about, I think, is... Uh, is both tragic, but but sadly happening more and more in different contexts. I mean, even in France, uh, there are women, uh, I know researchers, for example, dealing with uh, the Arab world, dealing with Islam, who are subject to exactly the sort of online harassment that you've mentioned. Uh. Um, I mean, the situation with Turkey, I am not an expert on Turkey. I've visited Turkey several times, especially when I was posted to Syria in the early 1990s. Um, in my commentary, in my public discussions about what's been going on in Syria over the last four or five years, it has I have been required to follow what's been going, what's been happening in Turkey, because um, uh, as as President Erdogan has changed uh, his politics uh, to suit himself, and has refashioned the society in Turkey in a way that uh, to an outside observer just seems incredible. Uh, it has amazed me dealing with uh, Turkish journalists posted in Paris. They no longer feel like they can go home. They have to be very careful, or they were at one point very careful about what they could say because they're, either their newspapers are being shut down in Turkey or newspapers were being shut down and they were afraid that they were going to be next. So this whole situation to me is just stark, startling, and frightening. And as we look at uh, the larger issues, whether it's Turkey, uh, sorry, Syria or, or wider in the region, Turkey, it, it strikes me that once Turkey was seen as a model for how many of the countries in the Arab world could look to how they could organize and make Islam as a political movement successfully integrated into a sort of a national project, and now we're finding that indeed Turkey is falling prey to the same uh, tendencies and extremes uh, that we were all worried about. Just to pick up on a, a couple of points that you, you've all aired in, in one way or another, uh, you talked, um, Merve, about the, the yes. very striking difference between Istanbul and the rest of the country, and you yes. talked about the refashioning, William, of what President Erdogan 
has done, you would presumably, the two of you now, um, acknowledge that there is that huge difference. And actually, if you went outside Istanbul and you went to the rural areas of Turkey, President Erdogan has a lot of support for what oh, he's yeah. doing. I, I would assume so. I mean, it, I've been in the UK for 20 years, so and I'm following it from a distance, as most of you do. But the difference is we have, we have two Turkey, and these two Turkeys are both in urban centers and rural sure. Turkey. So Erdogan has, you know, equally strong support in everywhere in, in Turkey. So we shouldn't dismiss that. But the problem is that feeling of insecurity, perception of insecurity arising from so many things, not only about gender, but almost everything you do and you feel is now really dominating what people are doing in terms of their life strategies. I, I will give you two more numbers, two more figures, if you want. One is, you know, Mary is not alone. In the last two years and a half, UK received 5,250 business entrepreneurship applications, visa applications from Turks, and 4,500 approved. So that is one number you should keep in touch. And before that, the total number of applications in the same category was just 4,700. The last number is Gallup World Fall. Gallup is measuring desire to migrate for all countries across the world. And before all these things happened and the coup, the number for Turkey was 14%. And world average was 14% as well. And in 2018, World average was 15, and in Turkey, that number rose to 30%. I wanted to bring Elif in with a brief final observation, and then Merve to you, but Elif. It could have been very a very different country. Very final quick word, Merve. Can you go back? Uh, yeah, uh, it is, it's quite sad, because what I had the chance to be able to afford to come to UK to move my business and change my life and take a chance. I have a lot of friends who are in uh, journalism, who are in acting, arts, and other who, do, who does not have the chance to get out and after my past interview the emails I got were three different emails one was how can we do what you did the second was you're a traitor because you left your country in a bad situation the third one was you we are lucky that you left this country we don't want you anywhere and on all these lists so this is basically what Turkey is right now we must uh, end it there but thank you both very much indeed for coming in uh, Merve Bayandir and uh, Ibrahim Sekeci Thank you both very much.